hate it. I missed it last year, but I'm excited about being here now. I'm excited. After a year of pandemic cancellations, the wait is over for track and field lovers. Good evening. I'm Alan Matthews. The action it's picking back up for athletes today as the 2020 Olympic trials resume after two days of rest. Now we're going to take a live right now to Hayward Field where Kendall Bartley and NBC 16 sports director Brandon Cameron join us tonight. The heat it's definitely climbing heading into the weekend. How's it feeling out there tonight, Kendall and Brandon? And the heat is definitely a big deal here at the Olympic trials. It's actually going to be affecting a few of the events that are expected to happen this coming weekend. And we'll break that down in just a few minutes, including what's that, what that's going to mean for the fans that are returning to the stadium. But first, Brandon Cameron is going to break down all the events that are happening today. It sounds like things just kicked off behind us. Yeah, Kendall, this is actually the latest day in terms of the schedule of events. Most of the events getting started right now. There were a couple events that started earlier this afternoon, the women's shot put and the women's hammer throw. But we're hearing the introductions of the women's pole vault right now, and that is really the first event of the day. Probably won't end this day until after 9 o'clock. The pole vault kicks off the evening slate, then the women's long jump at 545. We'll break, da break down that event later in the newscast. The races get running just after 6, the men's 1500, the women's 200, and the women's 800. And then just after 7, the men's discus begins. Then back on the track at 732, it's the men's 400 meter hurdles. Now, all of those are qualifying events, but at 8, the shot put will turn into the final round, also the final for the women's 3,000-meter steeplechase at 847. And sandwiched between those two finals, Oregon's Cole Hawker and Cooper Tier will run the first round of the men's 5K. Again, a lot of these events are later than we've been used to, so we will break those events down, not until 11, but we'll have it at 11. And while Brandon is breaking down the events that are happening on the track, we're turning our cameras to the stands. NBC. 16th, Olivia Young spoke with fans today about what it really means to see these trials happen in person. Countless athletes will walk through these gates before going on to chase the gold in Tokyo. But the thousands of fans in the stands have stories of their own. Here are some of the faces in the crowd. We're big track fans. We don't have anyone running, but we just enjoy the sport. One week into the Olympic trials and Hayward Field has seen a lot of fans. I love track. I love the long distance races. I love that. That's when the track meet starts, when the long distance runners come out there. Lovers of track and field flocking to an event they almost missed out on. So we're excited. Uh, two weeks ago, we didn't think we'd be able to come. From Eugene locals. We're riding our bikes up to catch some of the action. Check out the food yeah, scene. <laughs> check out the food scene and then go watch some great races. To cross-country visitors. Getting flights and getting accommodations and things like that. So it was, you know, last minute rush. Budding young track enthusiasts. It's really interesting watching all the athletes do different things. To seasoned vets. I've been attending uh, Olympic trials since 1984. This is the 12th uh, track trials that I've been to. And of course, proud parents of the athletes chasing Olympic glory. Obviously really excited, a little anxious. He's been seeking this goal relentlessly and sometimes in the rain and alone. And so it's really been a journey. Each day, 8,000 different faces sharing in that journey. The experience that you'll be able to take back and, and, uh, and, and always be able to live and say, I did this. United by an Olympic torch and a love for track and field. I love it. It's the best sport. Enjoying track and field, America's number one sport. Reporting in Eugene, I'm Olivia Young. And the fans that are returning to the stadium are definitely going to have to deal with the hot temperatures. Today is just a preview as to what we are going to expect this weekend. And once we hit those triple digits that we're expecting, it does become a safety yeah. issue. So USA Track and Field has announced that they are making some changes. They're going to be moving some of the races. Uh, the men's and women's race walks have been moved on Saturday to 7 a.m. Last night, they moved two more events to earlier earlier start times. The women's 10,000 meters originally slated for 6:44 on Saturday. Now they wouldn't they would have been in the middle of that intense heat, so it's now at 10 a.m. Then on Sunday, the men's 5K it would have also been run in those triple digit temperatures if it had stayed at its original time of 4:52. So now it's at 10 a.m. on Sunday. Now the free park and ride shuttle from the Valley River Center it will begin operating at 9. 
9 a.m. on both Saturday and Sunday. The gates into the venue here at Hayward Field will open to spectators at 9 a.m. as well on both mornings. Now, it's a great service for people that want to enjoy some of the action this weekend without sitting at Hayward during the hard, hottest part of the day. There will be limited food and drink concessions for those weekend morning races, though, but there will be uh, free water inside of the venue for people. And that's where we bring in NBC 16 Chevy Chevalier, who has all the details on these really hot temperatures that we're going to be experiencing this weekend. Yeah, Kendall, you know, I'm usually, I like to have fun with the weather, but this is, this is a very serious situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're about to see temperatures that might be the hottest temperatures ever so, I'm since 1892. Yeah. That's a possibility on Sunday. Let's take a look outside now. And these temperatures today that we forecast are a few degrees warmer than what we forecast, so we might even up the temperatures for this weekend. Uh, the, they're predicting triple digits for Saturday and Sunday, with Sunday being the hottest. So uh, it's 91 in Roseburg, 91 in Eugene already today. Tomorrow will probably be in the mid-90s uh, for uh, the forecast. And out here at the track, it's going to be warm tomorrow in the 90s, but then they're going to get into the 100s. So I would say, you know, if you don't have air conditioning, um, you got to find a way to really cool yourself down because triple digits, that's, that's not no joke. It's oh, very yeah. serious stuff. And we're, we're already starting to feel it today, yeah. so definitely. So let's toss it back to Alan, who's in the nice cold studio. Alan. Yeah, it is a little cooler in here, but thanks a lot, guys. And we'll check in back in with uh, Kendall and Chevy a little bit later on. Well, firefighters are keeping an eye on Oregon's forest as well as rural areas for potential wildfires. Many fire agencies are partnering with each other to quickly put out any fire before they can spread. Staying in touch with weather updates is part of their job since high winds and lightning have been a factor to many fires in the past. Preparedness is not just for their crews, but making sure that they have enough equipment ready, whether that's trucks or aircraft. Kind of the same thing as we've typically done. Uh, we have our fire resources that are all staffed right now. Um, we are assisting other places that are having fires as we speak. Um, we've got some of our folks assisting over in the S502 fire on the other side of the mountains. Um, we have some folks in Arizona and Colorado where fire season has started. But we'll continue to have our, our fire suppression resources out and available should a new fire start. Donaldson also says lightning fires can strike at any time during the summer, but they've seen more human caused fires than anything else. Coming up tonight on NBC 16 News at 530, local firefighters talk about being ready to constantly fight fires throughout the season. Well, new at five, at least one person confirmed dead and at last check, 99 people unaccounted for after a high rise apartment building collapsed near Miami Beach this morning. And NBC 16's Chris Pallone has the latest. A security camera caught the moment part of a Surfside Florida condo building came crashing down, collapsing into a pile of rubble. It happened around 1.30 in the morning. I was uh, about a block away, felt the, uh, the ground shake, and I heard, you know, what sounded like thunder. Nicholas Balboa ran to the pile of twisted metal and crushed concrete. Using his phone's flashlight, he spotted a young boy trapped in the debris. He was sticking his arm up through the rubble, uh, trying to... to see if he could, you know, be seen. So he was saying, can you see me? Can you see me? Please help. Search and rescue teams converged on the scene and were able to pull the boy out after more than a half hour. The collapse damaged or destroyed around 70 apartments, another 80 no longer safe to live in. Rescuers are racing against time using dogs, drones, and listening devices, hoping that some of the missing are still alive in between the collapsed floors. They have years of experience in this type of operation, uh, and they are doing everything they possibly can do. The Miami-Dade Police Department says 99 people are unaccounted for, but it's not known whether they were in the building at the time. I'm encouraging people to remain hopeful. We have seen it in man-made and natural disasters where we have found uh, people uh, in a pocket area hours later, days later. The Champlain Towers complex is 40 years old and officials say it was undergoing a safety certification. An inspector reportedly visited the site Wednesday. I was told he was on that roof yesterday. So what happened today, it's going to take a lot of investigating to find out, but we are going to get to the bottom of it because residents need to know. As the search for victims continues, the search for answers is just beginning. Chris Pallone, NBC News. Looking ahead to Friday, Derek Chauvin is scheduled to be sentenced for the murder of George Floyd on Friday. The former Minneapolis police officer was found guilty of second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder and second degree manslaughter in April. Judge Peter Cahill can give Chauvin as little as probation or more than 30 years in prison. Sentencing starts tomorrow at 1130 our time. And attorneys on both sides are expected to make brief arguments. Victims or family members can also make statements. We will be live streaming the sentencing that will be on NBC16news.com.
Well, coming up next on NBC 16 at 5, Oregon inching closer to the 70% vaccination goal. How many Oregonians need to get that first dose in order to reopen? The magic is still there and, and the people are going to be even more excited, so I'm really excited. A long journey to the Olympic trials coming up. We hear the story of one Texas heptathlete who is hoping that her latest Eugene visit leads to a shot at Tokyo, but her hopeful travels there will be different than how she came to track town. For Eugene, there's excessive heat warning out as well. Your complete forecast coming up next.